if everybody's ready, I'm really excited to get started. I want to have as much time as possible with you, Victoria, because I have been looking forward to this for absolute weeks. So let's get sort of the, the housekeeping stuff out of the way, and then we can dive into things a little bit better. All right, fantastic. So welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you are able to join us today. I have Victoria Clooney as my guest, and Victoria and I, we connected a little, I guess it was uh, Wealth Hacker, really, when we, when yeah. we kind of got to know each other and chat a little bit more, but the more we talk, the more we find we have like these similarities and these commonalities and values and integrity and, and all those good things, so I really thought it would be amazing to have Victoria as my guest on the webinar today, because she's been investing for a long time, and I know there's a lot of stuff out there, whether it's on social media or whether, you know, however we consume our, our content, our information, but there's a lot of stuff out there that you have to sort through and figure out, you know, who can I trust? Whose experiences are ones that I want to have? Who is living the life that I want to? Who do I want to learn from? So, one of the things that Victoria and I talked a lot about was some of the lessons that we've learned from I'm approaching 20 years as an investor. Victoria, although she's much younger than I am, is over 20 years as an investor and um, she's just done a phenomenal job. So I thought it would be really uh, really beneficial for all of us to be able to chat with her and learn, you know, what was it like to come through 2008 in the downturn? There's a lot of stuff on social media right now that's scaring an awful lot of people. Things are feeling a little uncomfortable for some of us. So I'd love to hear more from Victoria. We're going to share with you some of our takeaways about uh, 20 years of investing in real estate and what we've learned from it. So just a quick reminder, we are on Zoom and this is a webinar, so I we will utilize both the chat box and the Q&A. So the Q&A tab at the bottom is where you're going to ask questions for the host and the panelists that are related to the presentation. So questions that you would like us to answer to the group. The chat box, you want to make sure you click the drop down so that it says everyone, and that's where you can engage with us, with other attendees, comments, share ideas and thoughts. But the Q&A is what we will come back to because that prevents your questions from getting lost somewhere in the chat function. And our agenda for today, we're going to do a quick welcome and introductions. Victoria and I will have our discussion. We'll hopefully have time for a Q&A period at the end, and then I'll be back to do a quick webinar wrap up. So as always, I am your host, Elizabeth Kelly. I have been a real estate investor for almost 20 years. I am now a full-time coach. I was a trainer for Rich Dad Canada. Um, I've invested in most of the provinces in the country, and I've done pretty much every strategy out there. So I, my favorite thing to do is to be able to give back to the community that has given me so much time freedom and financial freedom and um, has helped me really find what I'm passionate about. And we are so fortunate to be joined today by Victoria. And Victoria has a ton of accolades. She has just been put on the board of the Ontario Real Estate uh, Investing Organization. So congratulations on your new appointment, Victoria. I know you'll do amazing things with them. Uh, she also runs a mentorship program. She's the leader of the Ottawa chapter of Real Estate Invest Her uh, for meetups. And um, Victoria, I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm going to apologize in advance. I was just telling Elizabeth that I lost my voice a couple of days ago, but, um, you know, I made a joke that if Tony Robbins can get by with a raspy voice, we can uh, push through today. So it is going to be a little bit raspier than normal. Um, and then I guess even just for clarification, it's just under 20 years. So like okay. full disclosure. So we are on the same page, really. And uh, I'm really excited to dive in. I'm really excited to talk about the hits and the misses because I think it's so important that we are open and honest about it, especially if we are out there in the public, because I do share quite a bit on uh, social media. And so it is important. And I love what you said about we have to be very critical or skeptical in what we see on social media because as everybody knows it is a majority of the highlight reel that we're seeing of people's lives right we're not seeing the downside and and so it's something that's important to be discussed and if you are seeing somebody and it's not to discredit anybody online it's just to say that 
we should be looking at it with a little bit of an objective viewpoint and ask the questions if it's definitely somebody that you want to work with or develop a relationship with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's part of one of the best parts of real estate investing is that everybody's journey is different. You know, our skill set, our, our background experience, our knowledge, our network, all these things come into play and they create this really different experience. So it's really important to know yourself, what you need, how you work well, how you learn best, and to make sure that you are matching up with people and organizations and information that is in alignment with those. And that mm -hmm. was, I think, one of my big mistakes that I made when I started out as a real estate investor. I just assumed that, you know, everything was equal and everybody was equal and every deal. And, you know, the more I got into it, the more I was like, well, this fits for me. This resonates for me. This creates the future that I want. But these pieces aren't working for me right now. And I think it's important to be able to find our voice and to say no to what isn't serving us. Absolutely. And there's an element of confidence that you have to have when you can start saying no to mm -hmm. opportunities or what's what appears as an opportunity. And then you can start to be more selective of what aligns with you. And, and I'm a big uh, promoter of values and you can call it whatever you want, like your belief system, whatever aligns with you. And when you understand what that is, then you start to use that as a compass for your decisions. But until you identify what those, what those really core values are to you specifically, because your values will be different than my values, then, then start to use that and, and don't go after everything. Yes. I, I couldn't agree. And um, with that being said, what I'd like to do is if you guys, everybody who's here, do us a favor, type in the chat box your biggest fear about investing in real estate. What is your fear that literally holds you back? It keeps you up at night. It, it's a, a major factor or contributor to any challenges that you're having in real estate. And while you're doing that, I, we promised you today that we were going to talk about five key learnings for newer investors. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of the five key learnings that we, um, that Victoria and I came up with that we want to make sure we share with everyone because they've been so pivotal in impacting our journeys. Okay. Wow. Failure, raising capital. Okay, renovation costs, trust. Absolutely, Joe, that's a big one. Picking the right thing to do with the resources. Oh, I love that one. That's amazing. Another bad tenant. Oof, those hurt. Those really hurt. Okay, so here are, while you guys continue to put those in, because I very much want to hear more, uh, five key learnings. So uh, our, our takeaway number one was, especially when you're starting out, finish each project before you take on another one. Until you've created teams, systems, and processes to support your growth and ensure and enable your scalability, it's really important that you finish one thing before you start the next thing. There's a lot of pressure out there to just jump in and take action, take action, take action, but there's very few people talking about, you know, how do you clean up the back end? What kind of systems and processes do you need to have in place in order to make your business scalable? and a number of those factors. So Victoria and I will circle back to that one. Uh, the next one we, we're gonna talk about is how to balance real estate with your nine to five, your family responsibilities, uh, and recognizing how to put your yourself in a state of optimal functioning. <laughs> ben, avoid paying the dumb tax to one project at a time. Absolutely, Ben. Uh, our third key learning is know your rules of engagement. I've been talking about this a lot more recently, Everybody should have a list of rules of engagement. These are your minimum criteria for deals. These incorporate your core values. They reflect your comfort level and your least acceptable position. And then be prepared to exercise emotional control when you need to in order to say, this deal, it doesn't feel right to me, or I don't think it's going to create the future that I want to have. And so key learning number four is make intentional decisions. Recognize that you are creating your future with the choices that you make now. So when you are making a decision, make sure that it is going to create the future that you want to be living. 
whether it's your income level, whether it's, um, you know, your, your uh, time availability, your financial freedom, whatever that future is that you want to have. And then our fifth one we're going to touch on today is developing your skill level to a critical point so that you are taking smaller, more calculated risks. And that requires you to know your current skill level and be ready to build on it from there. So I hope those five things are going to be beneficial for everybody today. Uh, Giovanna said, I'm driving. Uh, there is always a recording, Giovanna, unless there is a technical difficulty. There's always a recording. When you register for my webinars, you will automatically be sent the recording. And if you haven't registered, you can go to my YouTube channel and you will see recordings from all of my webinars from the last three years. So there will always be a recording for you. We couldn't let all these gems that Victoria is going to share with us just vanish into, <laughs> <laughs> into the internet. Makes it very all right, so, <laughs> Victoria, can you talk a little bit more um, when we said finish each project before you take on another and create um, you know, systems and processes? Can you share a little bit more about where that comes from for you? Absolutely. And so when I first got and start, started in investing, and yes, I was very young, I was 20 years old. And so, you know, my lawyer, I remember him explaining that I was the youngest client that he's ever had, and he still maintains it to this day. And um, it was really important for me to take on one project at a time because I didn't have the systems in place. And so it is something that people can get started at any stage. I really, truly believe that. However, if you want to be successful, if you want to build yourself up for success, is take on that one project at a time so that you can really put that focus into it. Now, as I've developed over the years and I've built systems in place and I have teams to help me and they bring certain systems and certain um experience that maybe I lack in like I am not spreadsheet oriented I'm not numbers oriented it's not where I thrive although I've learned it and I've learned how to manage it I have people on my team who are incredible with it and so now we can get through everything much quicker and so it's a great question from Dawn about explaining your systems so I used to do all of the analysis just by hand I would write out every expense that I could think of what I would need for rent. And uh, that's how I did it. Now, of course, I'm using an analysis, like an actual calculator that I have a lot of comfort with. I can project what I need for like 10 years. I can look at the return on my investment. I can build in uh, maintenance. And I don't just go directly on like 10% for every property. I think about the property. I'm, I'm much more intentional about it. So if it's a new build, I'm not going to have to build in as much maintenance as I would if it was a, a hundred year old property. Um, vacancy. I can be intentional about the area that I'm investing in. What is the vacancy rate for that area? Property management. I'm actually building that into my systems. I have a bookkeeping system because I have a bookkeeper. I have a, an operations manager who is, and I have property manager. So I have an operations manager who takes all of the statements from my property managers from every property goes through it line by line to make sure that there's no errors because human error exists and we've we've caught a number of them and then she goes and she takes it and she saves it into certain folders based on the property based on the month and the year so that my bookkeeper every month can take and then she will do her magic and so that way come tax time we have everything packaged up perfectly and I can look at everything I need at a moment's notice because it's also very important to keep a pulse on what's going on. So while we create systems and we bring people in to support us, you can't, that's not, that isn't grounds for just walking away and not taking responsibility because ultimately I'm responsible for everything that we go on. So yeah, that's why it's very important. Now I can take on more properties because I manage the people that are managing the work and that's the delegation. Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you who are kind of talking about systems and processes, one of the great places to start is the book, Who Not How. I spent a lot of time trying to beat myself into being a numbers person and uh, I read Who Not How and I went, oh, 
I don't have to do that. I can find someone to help me with that piece of the business. I had the exact same realization. And for the longest time, I managed my own properties. For 15 years, I did all of my own management because I was too cheap to pay a property manager. And after reading Who Not How, that was a game changer for me. I now build it in part of my systems when I'm analyzing properties. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And that's exactly what you should be doing. And I love too what you said, Victoria, about checking back in afterwards and knowing your financials. I work with a lot of people who are newer investors and they're so focused on finding the next deal that they're not checking back in, you know, three months after closing, six months, 12 months to make sure that those projections that they made before they bought the property are accurate. So they're continuing to run numbers with a faulty belief system, and they're repeating the same mistakes over and over again. The best way to learn is to really make sure that you look backwards and say, what went well in this deal? Where did I, where did I do well? And where can I level up? And those are the cheapest lessons we're going to learn. We're learning them from ourselves. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that because I mean, you're, you're a coach too. And I know you share all kinds of gems and, and wisdom with your clients too, about some of the mistakes that you've made. And that saves people a lot of time, energy, heartbreak, um, having to learn those same lessons yourself. Themselves. Absolutely. And I want to hear yours, Elizabeth, because I know that uh, you have systems in place. I can tell like, to, so yeah, what, what kind of systems are you using? Um, Well, it depends which aspect of our business, uh, of my businesses we're talking about. I have a property management company. I, of course, have real estate investments. And then I also have my coaching and consulting. Um, I guess what would be, if you guys can tell me, which systems would you like to hear the most about? Do you want to hear about property management systems? Do you want to hear about, you know, how I acquire buildings, my systems there? Or are you most interested in hearing about like financial systems? What would you guys like to hear? How I acquire (laughs) Of course, <laughs> all the above. Well, now, <laughs> maybe our next webinar should be on systems and processes. We've just extended management. this webinar by six hours. <laughs> exactly. Nobody's going back to work. They're spending the afternoon with us. Um, acquiring buildings analysis. Okay, Financial. let me think. Yeah, and it's a pretty good, pretty good, <laughs> a pretty yeah. good uh, cross section. Okay, so which one would be? All right, so let me give you an example. So for property management, a lot of us, I'll build on what you said, Victoria, where a lot of us start out in the beginning and we're self-managing. And the benefit to that is we believe that we're saving ourselves money because we're not paying a property manager. The reality is, first of all, if we're self-managing, we should be paying ourselves for that because nobody in the real world does work for free. Secondly, uh, we have to make sure we have tools and tools in place. And this is what I build my systems around. So the first thing we do is we choose our property management software. And in my particular situation, we chose Buildium. So we figure out what does Buildium, what can Buildium do for us? What activities does it support? And then I figure out how to build my systems around that. So if Buildium can do leases for me, then as part of my leasing process, what some of the steps are going to be, you know, input all the information into Buildium, create the lease, send it over to the tenant for review and signing before we give them keys. So a lot of our systems and processes are kind of learned the hard way. Things like if we don't have um, a hydro account number, proof of insurance, uh, a signed lease, first and last month's rent in our possession, there are no keys that change hands. I don't care if you wanna store something in there for five minutes. I don't care if you wanna move in early. I don't care about any of that. This is my process and my system. And most of my systems and processes in all honesty are created from learning things the hard way. So my goal isn't never to make a mistake. It's never to make the same mistake twice. I love that. I'd love that. And yeah, the the standard operating procedures and for people who may or may not know my background is military and like, that's how we thrive. Everything has an SOP that you follow. And if it doesn't, you create it. And so that's the way that you can make sure that you're not missing all of the little nitty gritty things that can happen when, you know, something derails because it's Mm -hmm. not for the perfect system. It's not for the perfect purchase. It's for when that purchase goes a little bit haywire, but then mm-hmm. you still have those systems in place to keep you on track. Yeah. Well, updating them when you learn something is really important too. Don't assume that your system or process you created is fixed in stone forever. 
Um, and I like to start with the end result in mind. So for example, when I'm working with my joint venture partners, I want to think about what do I want my partners to say about me? So what do I want? I want them to say that I'm professional. I want them to say that I'm on top of things. I want them to say that I'm responsive. So I go, okay, what systems and processes do I need to have in place in order for them to feel that way about their interactions with me? Well, the first thing I should do is I should have a newsletter that goes out every month that tells them what is going on with their deals that they're invested in. And then maybe every quarter, I want to have a meeting with them. You know, the first Thursday of, of every third month is we have 30 minutes together just to talk about anything, to answer any questions. Uh, I want to make sure that I know what my responsibilities are when it comes to filing taxes. So I want to make sure all the bookkeeping's up to date and they get all the information they need by the end of February in order to be ready to file their taxes for the end of April. So as long as I'm thinking about what I want to, do, to provide to other people, then the systems and processes just enable me to do that. And I usually go, what would I want if I was them? It's, I love, I'm, I'm liking this. So that is definitely, it's something that, because um, it, it allows almost like the empathy from the other side. So you're putting yourself in their shoes and you're not just thinking about it from your own perspective as the investor, you're thinking about it as the, the partner. And so it's so important because we can get tunnel vision and blinders on to like how we see it. And so we're active in our properties all the time. So we don't have the same questions that our passive investors might have. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's very true. And, you know, they're coming at things usually with, um, with a lower level of knowledge than we have as active partners. So mm -hmm. I feel like it's important that we're patient and we're understanding and we share, hey, listen, um, this is the information that you, you know, that you might want to know. And they might not even know the right questions to ask yet. Exactly. exactly. So Alex is asking, how do you vet property management company? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I usually start the vetting process for a property management company before I buy a building. So if I can't find at least two or three good options for property management, I don't care how good that deal is, I am not buying a building in that city. That is one of my criteria for when I'm searching for the next city I want to invest in. Um, because your property management company is going to make or break your cash flow. So if they are you know, manufacturing repairs, if they're not putting good tenants in and they're cons you're constantly having to pay for turnover and, and all the other costs, um, that's huge. So I always want to make sure I'm talking to their references. I'm asking other people in my network, you know, who's using this company? What's the experience like? And then I'm um, diving more into like, how do you advertise vacancies? What is your payment process like for investors? You know, there's a whole process that, that most management companies go through. We call it reconciliations. But I tell me about your reconciliation process. When should I expect my money? What do you do if this happens or that happens? How often do you contact me? Um, there's a lot of property management companies out there that aren't investing in software. My thing as an investor is I want to be able to know what's going on with my properties, no matter where I am in the world. So I want to see that they have a software that's going to enable me to go in and see who's paid rent this month. What bills do I have that are coming up? I have to manage my cash flow because the buck stops with me. If there's investors who need to get paid and there's not enough money there for rents, guess who's throwing in the money to make sure my investors get paid? So I want to make sure I fully understand and know what my my property managers, um, you know, how their what their operations look like and that their their current clients are happy with them. What about you, Victoria? What do you do? Yeah, I'm in full agreement with that uh, part, because part of the due diligence period would be to if you're going into a new area would be to find those property managers. And if you don't find ones that you feel comfortable with and that's answering all your questions, properly or that you've talked to other people for recommendations and it's important to also ask like those hard questions to the people that are recommending them to see you know if those answers line up with what the property managers are saying as well because you know you want to get those both sides um i oh gosh i had one other point that i was going to make about that yes price don't mm -hmm not go with property managers just because their price are different. I learned that the hard way. So if we're talking about mistakes, again, I went with property managers that weren't as experienced, didn't have as many systems in place, but only paid me when they needed 
when I was needing them. And so for me, I thought that was a great idea. And in fact, it actually ended up causing more issues in the long run. And then I had to bring in more professional property managers to clean it up. And so I'll never do that again and um, take the easier road. So yeah, you want to stick with the professionals because when stuff hits the fan or even just the basic lease agreement, like if you miss um, non-smoking, right? If you forget to put smoking in there or a clause, then that can really do some damage for you. And now you have tenants permanent in there that can continue to smoke in your properties because it's not built into the leases. And so there's all of these little nitty gritty things that professional property managers would know how to handle and prevent upfront. Yeah, I, I love that. My uh, my husband has a saying and he says, when you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. So <laughs> it's true, it's true. I know I've learned the hard way. <laughs> Exactly. So a lot of times and people will come and they'll say, well, you know, I have more units with you. So will you charge me less for property management? And I said, well, do you want a lower level of service? Yeah. Do, you, do you want me to fill your vacancies, you know, sl more slowly? You know, you really get what you pay for a lot of times. And property management is not a business where there's a tremendous margin, where it's not like jewelry, where there's like a 3000% markup. I mean, your property managers, you're trusting them with these investments that are hundreds of thousands of dollars so it makes sense to find the best qualified person not the least expensive person that's right and when you have that mindset you know you pay for what you get and then it's that you it's the, the abundance mindset i learned that about accounting as well started to pay for like really good accountants because they're going to ultimately save you money and help you make money and so you got to drop the mindset of like do it yourself or where can I find like the most affordable? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and your question should be, where can I find the best person to help me yes, with this piece? That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. Um, okay, so let's move on to our next one. This one I'm really excited to talk about. You're welcome, Alex. Hopefully we've helped you. Um, and this is how to balance your nine to five with, you know, family and other responsibilities and still, you know, make sure that you're getting enough time so that you can function at an optimal place. And of all the people I've seen in the world of real estate, I think you are one of the best. So can you share with us, you know, how you balance or structure your days to, cause you have a, a, um, a, a child, 10 year, old. Mm -hmm. 10 year old, and you're married and you're full-time in the army and you're doing your master's you're a busy lady I know it's um I will preface all of this with the fact that I have been called extreme my entire life and so it just is where I decide to put it put that energy because I've always been quite um uh I dive into things and I can I produce a lot and so it's been something that I've just managed my whole life but one thing that I found, you know, I'm 21 years of service in the military. And so, and I'm actually in the Navy, but I did join in the army. So it's, I mean, it's all pretty much the same. We're all one service, but I used to put everything into my job, everything. And it served me well. I, I got promotions. I moved through the ranks very quickly, got lots of accolades for it. Great. What I found though, is that there's always a cap you always hit a wall, right? You can only get promoted so much. You can only get so many raises, accolades. When you shift it into investing, it's endless. And so again, that was a shift for me and, and talk about like making mistakes. It's not that I regret so much energy into my job. It's just that I wish I would have had more of a balance and still would do a good work. I would never go into a job and not do good work, but I wish I would have put a little bit more of the energy and the investing at the early side. So now I've kind of flipped the switch. The way that I can manage all this, honestly, is with the three pillars of my company, it's healthy, wealthy, wise. And I really, truly believe that when you focus on that, then you can take on so much. So the, the health component is paramount. When you eat right, when you exercise, and again, it doesn't have to be the extreme amount that I do, but just shifts in your diet is going to make the world a difference. If people realize, like, say around Christmas time when you're gorging, you're eating lots of sweets, you're probably not moving as much. 
by the end of it, people are feeling lethargic. They're not motivated. Some people feel depressed and anxious and they don't understand why and the stress of the holidays. When you can keep that dialed in at all times and prioritize it, your energy levels are so much higher. And so that was something that was very, I was adamant about any job that I took when I, especially with the military, is that I required time to work out. And in the military, they actually do give you time, but in some jobs, it's not, it's not provided or it's frowned upon because you're too busy. And so the way that I explained it to all of my supervisors are, if you give me that hour in the morning, between eight to nine, that was when I was working out. I'd be at my desk for 9.30. The Victoria that you're going to get, the output that you're going to get, the clarity that I'm going to have, and the energy to do everything is going to be 10 times the amount. If you, if you take that opportunity away from me to like start my day with fitness. And so mm -hmm. that's how I've maintained it just even in my business. I start my day. Now, I wake up at 5 a.m., so I am a morning person and not everybody's a morning person. And so I go to bed at nine, nine 30, keep a very strict sleep routine. And that 5 a.m. window, I can actually work between five to six 30 and I can get so much done because nobody's bugging me. I'm not getting emails coming in. I'm not getting text messages. My kid's still sleeping. My husband's having a coffee so I can get a ton of work done. I work out between 6.30 to 7.30 and then between 8 to 8 or 7.30 to 8.30, I'm getting my kid ready, breakfast, lunch made, and he's off to the bus. And then for the rest of the day, I can then just continue to work. And so it's like, the other thing I would like to just mention is that when you follow what you're passionate about and what you're aligned with, I'm going to keep going back to the values then you're going to be continuously inspired and motivated and determined and hungry and just passionate about what you're doing. And it doesn't feel like work anymore. And it's how I've just operated. Of course, I'm doing things that I don't like to do, but you just won't see me lean into them as much. I will get them done, of course, but all the other stuff that you see me doing is really because I am so passionate. I, love I hope that, that. Kind of answered it. It felt long winded, but no, it was it was amazing. I and I love hearing sort of how you structure your day because that's something that in the past I haven't been great at. And then in the last couple of years, when I hired a high performance coach, I learned about bookends. So does anybody here know about bookends? Anybody familiar with the concept of bookends? I'll um I'll elaborate a little more on them. Nope. Okay. All right. Okay, good. So we'll we'll talk. Well, I'll just give you like the the thirty second version of bookends. So bookends. This is how we start our day. <laughs> Dave says they're great. Yes, they can be. They absolutely can be as long as you fill them with good things. Mm -hmm. So this is how we start our day and how we end our day. And the part in the middle of our day, typically we don't have as much control over. You know, our boss wants something. Our kids need something. You know, all these different. We have all these different demands. But how we start our day and how we end our day are one hundred percent within in our control. So when we start our day with intention, and this is a word you mentioned earlier, Victoria, and I want to make sure we touch on this. A lot of us are kind of going through life and we're struggling with intention. You know, we might not have a lot of clarity around the future we want to create. We might not know a lot of, you know, what are our goals that we want to meet. But when we start being more intentional with how we spend our time, it's like somebody gives you the gift of your time back. So I'll give you an example. When we lack intention, we spend an hour on social media when we should be falling asleep. When we have intention, we put our phone down at nine o'clock and that's the end of our phone. And then we go to bed. So bookends, how we start our day, how we end our day are two components that we have tremendous control over. Guilty. <laughs> I say that because I was too. Um, <laughs> so when we make good choices about how we spend this time, then we set ourselves up for success. So we start our day, you know, whether you're a morning person like Victoria or not a morning person like me, you know, you, you get up, but you don't touch your phone for the first hour. You, you just leave it there. You might do a little bit of journaling. Maybe you don't do a full on like rocking body workout like Victoria does, but maybe you do some stretching and some mindfulness, maybe a bit of yoga, some breathing 
some breathing uh, meditation, something like that. Then you make sure, you know, maybe you have a, a breakfast or maybe you don't spend time with the kids, whatever. At the end of the day, okay, what time do all the lights go down in my house? Because when I have these glaring overhead lights, I can't sleep as well. So maybe for me, um, at eight o'clock, all the lights go down in my house. I only have salt rock lamps on afterwards. Nine o'clock, the phone goes away. You know, I can journal, I can do, you know, yoga, whatever it is I want to do to wind down. Maybe I read for a little bit, but start your day and end your day with intention. And then the piece in the middle, you are so much more prepared to handle and to walk away with positive experiences from that. Does that help? There's a lot of science out there about bookends. Um, I can ask my high performance, I should ask my high performance coach for the, his recommendation for the, the best bookend, but he's helped me a lot with creating stuff yeah. and sleep is the most important thing we can do <laughs> but we all we all sacrifice that right we get busy and we're like oh i'll just I'll, I'll just get up early i'll just stay up late but literally like working out sleep has a tremendous impact on our productivity for the day yeah we have this thing in um, my group and we say like what are your rocks for the day if anybody yeah. has um heard the story about the professor that brought a jar into class love it he yeah put, he put rocks in this jar, like large rocks in the jar up to the brim. And he asked the class, does this look full? Is this full? And the class all answers yes. And then he takes the another bag out and he pours pebbles into it and he fills up the empty space. And he asks the class, like, is it full now? And the class says yes. And then he pours sand into it. And then he says, is it full now? And the class says yes. And so that's the analogy is that the rocks are your intention and you need to be putting them in the jar first identifying them first not last because if you were to fill that jar with sand which could be considered social media or just mm. like you know distractions things that happen in your life then the sand is going to prevent the rocks from all fitting in so you need to put your rocks in first and then your pebbles and then your sand and uh it's a very just like yeah Gina Wickman is a, another one who it's like, it's such a good thought process to think about. So yeah. if that's one thing that you can do is just wake up in the morning. I often do it just even before I open my eyes, I just think like, how do I want to show up today? You know, what's important on my list today? I reflect on yesterday, you know, what did I do good, but also what do I want to improve? And that's where that self-reflection and, and self-assessment is, is so important to be able to continue to grow and, and improve on the things that we want to and maintain the things that we're really happy about. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And when I'm having a day where I am struggling, my way to kind of flip my brain into being more intentional, into asking myself better questions, because asking yourself better questions is how you begin to change your habits, your mood, your patterns, all those things by asking yourself the better questions that Victoria just said. But the question I ask myself is, if I only had 24 hours left on this planet, is this what I would be doing with my time? And if the answer is no, then I'm probably not going to continue doing it right now. And if you create, it's called segment intending. And it's if you take your life and split it down into segments and figure out what your intention is. So what is my intention? Victoria said her intention for the day. If you're struggling with that, I've literally, um, I had a couple of surgeries last year and I was really struggling during the healing process. I felt very betrayed by my body. And I was like, okay, I, I need to get out of this funk. I need to, I need to stop thinking about myself and, and poor me. And, and I was like, what can I do for the next hour? That's going to make me feel better. What can I do for the next, for this morning, that's going to help my body heal faster and just break it down into as small a chunk as you need, but create that intention and make those decisions because those small decisions are going to compound over time and lead to a life that you absolutely love. Yeah, I like it. I could, there's awesome. so many, I could just keep going. <laughs> I know we have other ones, but this is awesome, Elizabeth. I'm enjoying this too. Is everybody else having fun? Is everybody learning? This is a bit of a different format for the webinar. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking for feedback. I love to hear if people are enjoying this. Okay, good. I know awesome. Elizabeth gave me permission to ask her questions as well. So I was really excited to, you know, have this like a conversation and and include everybody in this conversation, right? And so if something comes up that like we put in the very beginning that you're struggling with, drop it in there. And if we can touch on it, then uh, we'd be happy to. 
for sure. Um, so we have a, we have talked about in, in making intentional decisions, and specifically, we we need to be aware that the decisions we make right now are creating you know the life that we're going to live in the future. You know, when my husband and I decided to invest in multi unit buildings in 2010, we created the life that we're living now, where we're <laughs> You know, we own big buildings and we're property managing them because we didn't know enough to make sure we didn't, you know, buy in a town where we had an abundance of property managers to choose from. So um, let's see, why don't we talk about rules of engagement? Because I feel like this is a thing that, you know, a lot of investors struggle with, you know, whether they're brand new or whether they are, uh, you know, sort of at the point where they have a few doors, they have a few properties and they're thinking about growing and when I talk about rules of engagement, and uh, Victoria, you, because you're in armed forces, you might very <laughs> yeah. well have, yeah, we have, have yeah. a different perspective on it. But when I talk about rules of engagement, I'm talking about, you know, we we get hit with a lot of opportunities. Everybody classes them as opportunities, whether it's our realtor or a wholesaler or a JV partner or whoever it is. We need to know what an opportunity actually looks like for us. So what is the minimum return on my investment? How much time and energy is required? Um, you know, what kind of knowledge do I need to be able to comfortably execute this particular investment strategy? Um, you know, what kind of qualities must be present in a joint venture partner before I'm willing to, to take them on and to commit to working with them? Rules of engagement are basically anything that falls below the rules of engagement. I'm not going to put any more time or energy into. I'm going to dismiss it immediately. And then only deals that meet these minimum criteria might have the potential to become something that I would actually do in the future. So what are your thoughts on that, Victoria? Uh, love it. So for me, like, I would say my rules of engagement, my the ethics are, are big, very important for me. So I think a lot about ethics and how I want to approach a property. And when I'm looking at properties, because there is a million and one strategies to bring a property up. So to increase its value to, you know, force that appreciation. But for me, what I really did find is that it some of those strategies didn't align with my ethics. And so I started to focus more on properties. And I, I kind of dubbed it that like feel good investing, because that is why I'm doing this at the end of the day. It's because I want to feel good. And so there was a lot of friction and, and um, between landlords and tenants. And I was just really feeling worn down by, by that approach. And um, so I kind of flipped the switch. So that's first off, like, do I feel that this purchase has integrity and ethics? Um, and it's not to just go in and clean sweep tenants because tenants are people too. And pe and if they've been there for years, then uh, I have to make sure that I'm taking an approach that respects them and um, is also aligned with my ethics. The second one for me is that that property, I will not buy a property that does not service the debt. And it just goes and then that's aligned with the ethics because I don't go in to clean sweep tenants. And so if the property can't service the debt, I am willing to negotiate. I love negotiation. My background is human behavior. And so I find that I have a good grasp on how to connect with sellers, how to negotiate in a way that it feels like a win-win for everybody. The sellers can get their price that they want but I get the terms that I want, that I feel comfortable with, that I can expect, you know, over a certain period of time that the building can get to that point. And so for me, that servicing the debt is incredibly important. It doesn't even need to cash flow, but I'm still putting in the measures of property management, maintenance, and vacancy. I'm still accounting for all of that, and it has to service the debt. And then the final one, the emotional control, which I kind of, I'm pulling back from the, the number two that we had, because for me, from like a rules of engagement standpoint, I'm not going to get upset. I try very hard not to get upset. I'm human. This is a constant battle. Everybody, mindfulness is a forever pursuit. And we are only like, you will never have it down. And I have a lot of education and training in this area, but I have to work on it. And I think that I'm just like one of the best candidates for it because 
I can be like pretty hot headed. I can be strong minded and, um, you know, want to go in and, and be forceful. And so something for me has just been maintain control, not to get upset, not taking anything personally. If we're unable to come to, to common ground, then leaving on good terms, because there's always opportunity to circle back. There's, you know, you can plant seeds. And so I just have changed that um, approach. And so that's been, those are, I think would be the three main ROEs that I would uh, prescribe to. I love that. Yeah. And if I can ask a little more, because your concept of I don't buy buildings with the intention of like doing a sweep and evicting all the, the tenants who are paying low rent, um, that would be pretty controversial right now in the real estate space, because there's a lot of people doing deals right now where the only way the numbers work is if they do a sweep and, and clear out tenants. Um, what kind of feedback or what kind of thoughts do you get when you say that that is, that is what your values are? Uh, feedback from the sellers or feedback from the investors, like in the community, which all of uh, the above, all the above. Good. Yeah. So um, from the sellers, then the feedback is typically good. It's understanding. And a lot of times the sellers have connection with their tenant. And there's a big reason why the tenants are underpaying still because the sellers don't want to increase either. And so I really try to like hone in on that with them to let them know that, you know, we aren't the type of landlords that come in and do that. And it's not to say that I've never, you know, removed tenants. There are tip, there are particular tenants that I've acquired in the past and they just don't respect the property. They're problematic. And so those ones to my property manager, you know, do what you got to do following all the rules, of course. But if they're, um, if they're going against what the lease agreement is, then I've, I'm, I'm good on that. No problem. But I have other yeah. tenants that have been in their property in the property for say 25 years, you know, mm -hmm. when I show up and the bed's always made mm -hmm. and he's so sweet and, you know, they're very just kind. And so that's a decision you have to make. So the sellers are usually on board. They're usually understanding. And that's when we can start opening up that communication. Cause I explained to them that I do want to give them their price. I recognize that the market has increased and um, we can find common ground there. Other investors, and I, I don't want to be judgmental and I don't push my values on anybody else's, but it does open up that conversation. And then the like-minded people become attracting and then want to learn more about, well, what kind of investments am I getting into? What type of strategies am I employing? Because I think the majority of people don't feel right about doing this, but think that maybe that's the only direction to go. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes it's a breath of fresh air when you can learn that that isn't the only one. I recently purchased a motel and that was a big part for me was because I want to make money. Don't get me wrong. Like I love making money. We do this to make money. And the motel in my, in my eyes is, the value that I put into this motel is the value I can get back. And the government can't tell me what I can charge for rent. People are transitory. If the government changes policies with Airbnb short-term rental, which they just did in Nova Scotia last week, they're they catching up to yeah. Ontario. They can't touch my motel because this is hospitality. And so I am somebody who likes to have control of my investments, of where I'm, you know, going and what I'm doing with it. And I mm -hmm. do lead with integrity. And so if I am given carte blanche to raise rents, it's not what I'm going to do, but I am going to get things up to market value. So I've been met with very positive feedback with that because it is, I think, um, not a unique approach, but maybe just not as um, popular right now. Yeah. I love that. And, and Alex is actually asking what the strategy is to increase the income. And 
in my world, I go and sit down with the, with the tenants and I say, Hey, listen, this is a situation I'm in. You know, I would love to be able to, you've been here a long time. That's why your rent is so low. I'd love to be able to continue to keep it this low. Unfortunately, it doesn't make sense. And so, you know, what a lot of investors or owners would do is they would just do no repairs. They do nothing for your unit, but can we have a conversation? And, you know, if I come in and fix up your bathroom, or if I come in and do some upgrades in the kitchen, you know, could you come up with a couple of hundred dollars more a month? And when you factor that out into what the, you know, the increase in the value of the building is by say $250, then it gives you an idea. Well, if the, if the value of the building is going to go up by, you know, I don't know, let, let's say 50 or $60,000. If I put $10,000 into a new bathroom for them, they pay $250 a month more. My building, I, I've, I've leveraged and, and grown the value of my building substantially more than the money I've actually put in. So that's actually our sort of preferred strategy is to work with the tenants who are there and try and negotiate mm -hmm. with them. Most tenants are very aware that a lot of people are doing evictions and they don't want to be evicted, especially when you have someone who's fantastic. You know, he takes good care of the property and the landscaping. To me, that would be my opportunity to come in and say, hey, thanks so much. You do such a fantastic job. Listen, I'd like to talk to you about, you know, can we do something in your unit if you could afford to pay 100 or 150 or 200 more per unit then you know I'd be happy to do some upgrades for you yeah it's I mean it's a good good question because there's certain things the the strategies that I'm using like I do have one property right now that's going to be up for renewal next year and it's not a property that's serving me as much anymore but there's a family in it and so it is a single family home that again I just I either my option is to sell it, but my approach is going to be to contact them and offer them the rent to own for this property because, you know, you it is a business at the end of the day. And so to be able to give them some opportunities up front so that they have the choices. I love your idea, right? Just having these frank conversations. Um, if the property is not commercial, uh, a HELOC, like I have one that's in my personal name that I've had for some time. And that property has appreciated so nicely that I've done a HELOC with it. I haven't had to increase the rent, but the HELOC yields me great returns because I can now lend it privately or I can invest it somewhere else that's going to give me those returns. And so there are different strategies. And then also just, I don't buy properties that don't service the debt and there's, yeah. um, and fixed. I'm, I'm a fixed term girl. And uh <laughs> It's not, I have like one or two that's a variable, but most of my properties, I've always just gone fixed. I like knowing what my numbers are going to be that yeah. assurance. And that's part of my risk management. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, we've got a couple of quick questions and we're nearing the top of the hour now. So oh Jamie, do I have the lease amended before doing any renovations? Absolutely, Jamie. Yeah, I, I don't. As far as I'm concerned, if it's verbal, it's not worth anything. Everything I do is always in writing and it happens before I do it because that's a lesson I've learned the hard way. <laughs> um, okay, two quick questions. Well, one quick question and one uh, long question. So Jacqueline said, what software do you like a PM to use? I'm most comfortable and familiar with Buildium, but I know there's a lot of great ones out there now that are, are you know, biting at Buildium's heels. They were the biggest ones for a while. Um, but definitely that, uh, Buildium is the one that I go to. What about you, Victoria? What are you most familiar with? Tenant I'm, Cloud from Alex? Yeah, no, we just have our own, we hire property managers, but we're actually, this is the next stage for us because in Nova Scotia, I, I've hired all my property managers, but now that we have bought here in Ottawa, we are transitioning to be opening up our own property management company. So that's our next stage. <laughs> So I just wrote down Buildium. And yes, I've played with Tenant Cloud before. It wasn't my favorite. And then I was old school and just did it all myself, which again, was not recommended for the past like 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> Spreadsheets can be really challenging. Um, a property management software should do, do a good job, not just of managing the finances, but managing tenant requests, managing repairs, managing bills, all those kinds of things. Amazing. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, Laura has a fantastic question about what are the questions we should ask to contractors, property managers when interviewing them. Laura, I love that one. 
And I was actually thinking about doing a webinar on that. So maybe that would be something we could put a pin in and we'll have an answer for you in the next webinar coming up. And then uh, Wendy had asked, we're looking for more information on rent to owns, how it works, how is it different than selling? Wendy, Listen. you and I have a call tomorrow, so I will make sure that I fill you in because rent to owns is my absolute love. That is my favorite strategy, all time favorite strategy. Okay, so uh, let's wrap up for today then. First of all, I want to thank you, Victoria, for making your time available. I know you're such a busy lady and we so appreciate your input. You are just lovely. I just, yeah, this, this was great. <laughs> I, you know what, I could literally be here. I'm kind of sad <laughs> that it's over. It's, um, it's been a pleasure, an absolute pleasure. I mean, your community is incredible, just everybody and, and, you know, all the activity and comments, we're reading it. And thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure. And for those of you who are familiar with our Resilience Summit from last year, we are going to be having another one this year. And we are so fortunate to have not just Victoria, but her partner, Noel, uh, who is out of Nova Scotia, who's going to be part of our summit as well. So stay tuned for more information. That was one of the quickest hours ever. Damn. You guys are amazing. Okay, quick. Let me quickly wrap up the webinar here. And um, today we are doing a giveaway. Uh, we, you and our webinar attendee will have the choice to choose between uh, Dahlia Secrets books, which is investor financing, seven secrets to getting all the money you want, or between Cherry Chan's book, which is complete guide to Canadian real estate, uh, complete taxation guide, sorry, to Canadian real estate investing. So uh, I just Victoria, have to say, no lie that Cherry Chan's book is on my husband's bedside table right now as we speak. I recommend it to everybody. I love it. Oh, that's amazing. So now it's got the uh, the Victoria uh, star of approval as well, <laughs> yeah. which is amazing. Yeah, saves you money. Um, so can you give me a number between one and 61, Victoria? And it's, and the attendee who has that number will be have the choice, have the opportunity to pick their choice of book, and then we will be mailing it out to them. So between one and 61. 57. 57. Love it. Okay, great. And for those of you who are new to my real estate investing community, I encourage you to please join, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can go back, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, you can see the last three years worth of webinars that I've done, all the experts that I've interviewed, and there's a ton of fantastic information there uh, for each of you to learn and grow as investors. And if you would like to get in touch with myself or Victoria, you are more than welcome. We always love to engage and interact mm -hmm. with people if we, you have questions that we didn't get a chance to cover on today's webinar. Or you know what? If you have ideas or topics you'd like to see us cover for future webinars, um, by all means, reach out. We, we love to hear from people. And I will be in Ottawa in early April. So if you are in the Ottawa area, Victoria and I are going to probably do a meetup, networking event, something like that. So we're yeah. really excited. Stay tuned for more information there. Now, regarding my next webinar, I am still working out the details of who and what. It's going to be March the 20th, so mark your calendars for that. It'll be another lunchtime webinar, I believe, depending on um, who we end up with for our final speaker, but super excited about that. Thank you to all of you for spending your lunch with us. Thank you, Victoria, for sharing all of your wisdom and experience, and thank you very much for your service. 21 years is, is a long time, so thank, thank you. you very much for that. You guys have a fantastic rest of your week. Have a wonderful March break and we'll see you on the other side later in March. Bye-bye. Thank you.